First of all, I'd like to introduce Anne-Marie Cunningham. Anne-Marie is a clinical lecturer in primary care and public health at Cardiff University. And Anne-Marie is going to talk on, on being public, how social media reshape professional identity. Anne-Marie. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to this conference. I have to say it really was, um, I was delighted to be invited and a little bit surprised and I hope that what I'm going to talk about today is uh, of interest to you. So professional identities, quite often when we start talking about professional identity and digital identity, we focus on all the things that go wrong. We have this notion, we talk a lot about medical students and other people, teachers, putting things photographs leaking out on Facebook that really shouldn't and uh, we imagine in some kind of way that this digital identity is just some like bits of information that are kind of tracked and pulled together about people but today I'm going to talk a little bit more about very positive a positive way of actually thinking about being online in a social space or what, how we should be, uh, be thinking about this so if you were to sort of say well you know who am I I've already given you a few little clues about some of my identity in that previous slide. So there was my name and my institution, uh, where I, the department that I'm in, and also I had my, my Twitter ID. So increasingly the space of, 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 of um, social media is somewhere where I am recognised as being a, a professional. And where, I, where I'm from, if you can hear my accent, uh, Actually, where, where, where you're from also tells people about your identity. This is kind of in a way fits in um, with Dave White's idea of space and place and residents and visitors. In a way, I have moved to being a resident in some, in some of these spaces. But actually, so where am I from? Well, it's about this, if you don't know who, who can recognise this lovely part of the world, this is uh, about a mile and a half, if that, up the road from where my mum uh, lives and where I, I grew up uh, in the Mourns in Northern Ireland. And yes, there are sheep around there. And you may, uh, it actually must have entered into my psyche and my identity more than I thought because I actually have this picture as my Twitter backdrop. Um, <laughs> and these are Mourn black-faced sheep who are very good at thriving in a colder climate. So maybe we can learn something from the sheep too. But I also added to my Twitter bio that I am determined not to be one of the sheep. I added that on uh, by, I don't know, a year or so ago. And I don't know, I just uh, I had this feeling that actually quite often whenever you're online, people are, there is a kind of herd identity. We all are sometimes feeling like we're looking in the same way. And I don't feel like that. I uh, pride myself a little bit in maybe being more critical and thinking of different viewpoints and being reflexive and I'm going to talk about how social media actually forces, if you're going to be a professional, it, you're nearly forced to, to be in that, to take on multiple viewpoints. Um, so I know that you're maybe not so familiar with medical education, although there are great examples here. I've seen lots of very good examples about use of technology. Um, but just so you can get an idea of where, where I'm coming from. Uh, there's been about, one, I'd say, 100 years of criticism from 1868 whenever the GMC took on responsibility for medical education. All the science is poorly integrated into the curriculum. Um, we've got, an, it's, too over, it's too full. We've got too many facts. We're not really managing to do this job that well. Uh, and I've said that, so I've, I've had that stopping in a way in about the middle of the 20th century, but it has actually continued. But there have also been a long time that we've had a lot of in innovation. We do like the three letter acronym, like other people. So there's PBL, Problem Based Learning. Uh, which started in McMaster in Canada in the 70s and is being rolled out across into other sectors. CBL, case-based learning. Um, so lots of different approaches. In some ways, I would argue that we are a bit post-lecture in medicine. We, we have thought about different ways of, of approaching education. And one of the, the issues is that medical education, I mean, you're here using um, terminology of Robert Keegan, who has from his constructive developmental <coughs> approach to, to, to uh, transformative learning. So there's this idea about information as against transformation. So we're filling up the students with all this content and maybe that was the feeling for quite a long time that, that was going on. And we had uh, the, the, the other process which is happening about transformation, becoming a doctor, developing that identity, becoming a, uh, a sociocultural processes, those are there as well. And traditionally they've been through apprenticeship, um, 
encouraging students to be involved in reflective sort of processes, mentoring. So that's how we go about um, transformation. And then a little bit on about me. So uh, we've already have alluded there. I have this quite, like many people here, I'm sure, quite a complex professional identity. So I am a doctor, I'm a GP, I'm a practitioner. I uh, work in the South Wales Valleys. I also am an educator, so I'm teaching some parts of the course and I've got a special interest in e-learning or the use of technology in the course. I am a researcher, I've done clinical research, I've done doing education research and I'm also a student. I'm enrolled for a doctorate in education in, social, in the School of Social Sciences in Cardiff University. So all these bits and pieces are coming around. These are all communities that I'm part of and identities that I have and I would say are actually represented in public in, in social media as well to more and greater uh, extents. And if we think about in an offline life, the one that which I've been longest socialised into is definitely being a doctor and a family doctor. That's probably always, unless something very radical changes, is going to be an essential core part of who I see myself as. And the, 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 uh, being an educator, the community, and finding a community within, that, well, within my own institution there are people, but how do I link up and connect to other people? And there is very clearly to me the idea that medical education, just as medicine itself is, is a practice. It's not a, a science. And uh, even when you go to conferences, I went a few years ago to two medical education conferences, which actually where this all started out from. And I realised that the kind of things I needed to know and wanted to be to make me a better educator was to be able to share practice with other people, to get into this nitty gritty and, and, uh, and uh, you know, be able to connect with others. But actually these organisations which I was a member of at that time were not really giving me a great deal of opportunity to do that. So after you came away from the conference, there was this kind of feeling, a sense of isolation. How could you actually get contacting with other people uh, and, and, and be developing this identity even more? And so I decided that I would just kind of take the bull by the horns and go out and try and find people myself. And I would start a blog. So my started blog in October 2008, Wishful Thinking and Medical Education. I'd love you to go along and have a look and see there. And I also started popping up on Twitter. And I said that I wanted to find people to learn together with. That was my, that was my goal. And I quickly formed a, a network of other people. These were some of the first people I was in contact with. Sarah Stewart, a midwife in New Zealand. Deirdre Bonacastle, who's an educator in uh, Saskatchewan in Canada. Natalie Lafferty, who's a very good colleague uh, who's got a special interest in e-learning uh, and is based in Dundee in Scotland. Natalie and I had got, started getting very close in the way that we were, well, we still have differences of opinion, I'm sure, about the way that things that we, we do. But we actually, for, we, we spent a long time communicating online and through Skype and different things. We actually met up for the first time at a, a workshop we organised together at a conference this year. So uh, the other two I still have to wait a bit, a bit longer to meet. So this new network was there and I suppose at the start, this is, you know, I read Dave White's paper and I thought, so so much of what I was going to say in a way was related to this. At the start, I felt that we were spending a long time, or I was, talking about tools, social bookmarking, how different technologies actually would sort of work um, within, within my practice and how they might, how they might make me a better uh, uh, educator. Uh, uh, and I, I thought that they would probably meet some needs. And I went off the next year to this conference, Medical Education Conference, ASME, Association for Study of Medical Education. And I said, and I talked about how supporting scholarship medical education could be done by uh, social media and networks. But actually, quite surprisingly, this did not lead to a paradigm shift in scholarly communication and medical education. Uh, but it's changing. Things are moving on. Uh, at the ME last week in Vienna, nearly 3,000 delegates. There were people, a lot of use of Twitter, people using blog blogs afterwards. We're getting on to having Google Plus starting to talk about, you know, if we wanted to explore these areas, how would we do it? And also, We've started going out and exploring these spaces for medical education ourselves. We've started um, a, a, a Twitter chat with a hashtag, hashmeded, and there are lots of very interesting things that are coming out, interacting with students across the world, particularly in the UK. We've got different one at nine o'clock on, on a Thursday in the UK, and then at nine o'clock Eastern time in the US uh, a few hours later, and so we. We're starting to explore these things, and the people. Uh, and what I'm going to say is, that we've also been. I've also been thinking all along about how, 
what I would learn and what's going on there would actually influence my practice as a doctor. And uh, I'm not, I have to say, a techno-evangelist. I don't think that I am. In fact, if you Google Web2 skeptic, the first thing that comes up is talking about me. I'm being referred to as a Web2 skeptic. I was talking to this, uh, chatting online with Dr. Vez, he's not a big medical blogger, sort of saying, I can't, you know, as yet, I'm not sure how to learn about these new technologies and teach students about it because I'm not really using them in my practice yet. Now, that's not because there really isn't a need. Um, I would say that there is, in a way, this kind of myth of information overload in a sense. We talk about it as if, you know, doctors and people are just swamped by all this different information. They cannot make their way through it. There are so many different journals and papers and you can never keep up to date. But in fact, that is manageable. Um, this generic sort of scientific information is codified, it's searchable, you can filter it. What's actually missing, the information underload, I could say, is this local practical information. It's about practice, it's tacit. If it is codified, it's often poorly presented and not hard, very easy to access. People putting out guidelines in PDF online, I can't really manage it very well. And it's not easy to find. And it does, often doesn't exist in forms that you can actually um, find it. So that is true for medical education, for education practice, and for medical practice. And so there, there is obviously a, you know, a lot of way to go in this, but we, we still haven't got there, and that's partly because there are all these tensions about these things that we know about and talk more about how it is, what is my identity being online, why, what, what, should we be anonymous or not, what are the risks, um, who's in control, who's got the power over these sort of spaces, who do you trust, um, what are the issues over access, so these are all p points that are must be part of why this is not happening more yet. It isn't just about not knowing the technology. If we people could always work around it and make it happen, it's because of these cultural sort of issues. And you end up with this kind of balancing act, as we talked about yesterday, about this open being open versus closed. If you're open, there is more risk, and you're, but you're sharing and learning against. You can be safe in your own network and be quite um, in a private sort of space. Um, and I'm going then to kind of move on to this. Is, this is just a model um, in a way to kind of help us rethink uh, how, what we actually mean about this about identity. And again, I've, I've used this idea of Robert Keegan's about a constructive developmental approach uh, to, to transformative learning. And this is about the kind of ways that we know, how, what are our personal kind of epistemologies and way of being. And he, talk, he talks about the socialised mind the self-authoring mind and the self-transforming mind. Now I'm going to sort of suggest that if we're talking about professional identity, I'm socialised into an identity by being a doctor. I have to, I'm, whenever I'm being a doctor, to a certain extent, I am meeting the guidelines and institutions, the GMC, what other bodies, what my colleagues actually think. So people, you can be socialised uh, and be meeting the expectations of other external uh, bodies to, or people to you. Then there's also self-authoring. You've taken in the values yourself. You've decided your own values. And that's what actually influences your identity and how you, how you practice. And then this notion actually of being able to step outside that, be able to view it from the outside and see the different viewpoints, be reflexive and consider other people's point of view. And in a way, I'll say you know, that this is, this is in a way an aim I would say that we have in general in medicine. We expect doctors to be able to take on board the view of their, their patients and be reflexive and not come in just with these are the rules and this is what we do or these are my rules but actually I'm working with you. So how is this then related to social media? Well it's also needed in the sense that there aren't rules out there. This, this is about this talk uh, about the Facebook is the Wild West from a Harvard Health expert was a study looking at patient communities online. There are no rules there, there yet. This is a kind of new frontier. We can't rely on being socialised into these spaces to know how to be and what to, how to behave because we haven't, there aren't enough people sort of there and we haven't figured it uh, out yet. And instead, you're either depending on your own internalised values that you have taken from other places uh, and you're probably also being exposed to, to other ways of considering what your identity is. And I'm going to tell you about this little story um, just as a way of illustrating this. So although if you go and you look at my Twitter profile, you'll see that I've made nearly up on 40,000 tweets over the last um, three years or so, um, I 
don't think that I, I, it's not my mind that most of the time I'm projecting myself as a doctor, even though I have GP as the first word of my Twitter bio. And I very rarely get approached, I would say, just as being a doctor or being asked sort of for advice. But in this occasion, a few months ago, somebody said to me, could they ask me a quick question about a definition of something medical? Now, I didn't know this person. They weren't, it wasn't somebody I was following. And I sort of thought, well, how do I respond to this? What, well, it's about definition. This is about information. Like if a medical student I'm, in, I'm involved in these stats, if somebody asked me something, I'd respond to it. So, of course, I'll... I'll kind of, you know, I'll respond to this. So I said, well, yeah, go ahead. I'm, you know, pretty good by definitions. I can cope with that. And the response then was, well, can you tell me what distant metastases mean? Now, if you know anything, this is about advanced cancer. So we're moved away from just a simple kind of thing of give me the information towards this is a situation where obviously somebody has, for some reason, asking quite an a, a emotional person sort of question. So you can, you can I've, I asked the, the person's permission, and I have blogged about this, about this interaction, and uh, so you can, you can see um, more, more about the story. I don't have time to go into it uh, all now. But this made me kind of step back and think, well, why am I, what is this, what does this tell me about my identity as being a professional in this space? So going back to this idea of being socialized, I blogged about it, and somebody from the US responded, and they said, you need to check with your licensing body was that entering into a doctor-patient relationship? So there, the idea about how to be there was from a socialised point of view. What were the rules? People sort of saying, why have the GMC not told us yet about how to be in social media? Lots of people issuing guidelines about how, how medical students and doctors and people should present themselves and be within uh, social media and these other public spaces that we have not, uh, we've not really had a, a need for this before. I was approaching it more from my kind of self-authoring point of view, my values. To me, um, being a doctor with a patient was about relationship and um, about relationship and uh, service. And I didn't feel I had that with that person. For me, this wasn't really about a doctor-patient relationship. This was about me giving some information to somebody I met online. But by blogging about it, by thinking about it, and realizing that actually, if you can step back, why was that happening? Why was somebody coming and asking me who they didn't know about what distant metastases meant? What conversations were not happening? What about what I tell myself about my profession and uh, uh, that we actually say we give people and we communicate and whatever? Social media forces you to realize that all the stories that we tell ourselves are not actually all true. We are, there is a different world out there. And you see this whenever you start looking at the, our discussions about medical education. We can be very cozy in our own spaces, talking within these rooms and whatever with all the people who kind of more or less sometimes think the same way as us and are coming from the same perspectives. But once you go out and you move into this, you have to be able and prepared to be self-transforming, to be engaged and take on other people's viewpoints. And so I'm just going to sort of nearly finish up with this idea of this, this came from a Norwegian medical student and this was at this conference last week. And she said, to be the doctor, to be a professional, is to be who the patient needs you to be. So it wasn't about what, the, what the, the, your organization tells you. It's not even about what you think. But you must tie that in with who the patient needs you to be. And as we move forwards, we're going to have to take on board that our values may not be in step with some of the people that we're, 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 we're working with. We have made the decisions about privacy and what people give away. How are we going to do whenever people say, I want to have a conversation with you in public? What about my, where do I actually come in then? Well, do I want to be a practitioner, practitioner in public? I am pretty clear at the moment that I don't feel comfortable with that, but how will I take on board and actually deal with those situations? And the other thing is that as an educator, I actually asked one of my own students, um, asked privately on Twitter, you know, what do you think my presence my presence on Twitter tells you about me as an educator, a learner, um, a, as a doctor. And this is what she said. I hope. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, clicking in the wrong place. Uh, she said this. So my identity, what she learned from about me and those things, was not the the links that I shared. It wasn't a view a, a viewpoint. It wasn't information. It wasn't uh, even. It was about what she saw about interactions, about how I conducted myself with other kind of viewpoints, how I 
took on. Um, that that's that's what I was was modelling to her. It was about this giving her an idea about how to relate to other people online. Perhaps she didn't say she would actually follow it, but I imagine that that that, that in a way as an educator, that's that's what I would. would, would, would was managing hopefully to do, to, to be modelling uh, other ways of, of being. So just finish up with this idea again that we talk too often, I think, about digital identity and professionalism and professional digital identity as this, bits of information that are actually coming together. But it's not that. People view me and make, a, make their mind up, and the important people, the people who I actually am working with uh, as, an, as an educator, or possibly also if they come online, my patients and people will, it won't be about these little random bits of information, but it'll be about how I interact and how I am um, through my relationships, my, my uh, relational kind of identity. So that's all I want to say. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. That was great. Um, question time now. Can you raise your hands if you have some questions, but then please wait until the microphone comes round uh, before speaking so we can capture it for the online presentation. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed your presentation and um, I think it's an important topic and I just, I wonder if, um, I, it reminds me of Irving Goffman's work yes. in, in terms of yes. performing yourself and I wonder if what um, I'd, I'd like to hear your your comments on um, the sort of skillful um, use of different identities in these contexts. I suspect that professionalism sometimes has to do with how how well you move between identities rather than the individual identities themselves as much. And perhaps that this is even more relevant now that we've got these. Uh, social media. Yeah, yeah, I think that that, I suppose my view is that it nearly is moving on to being, I, I don't have a very, not a lot of kind of, I, I keep things like my Facebook sort of profile and everything quite close down, my holiday pictures, but actually it could be public, it wouldn't really, really matter. But I think what we're moving in a sense into, and I haven't really talked a that much about here, <laughs> how much, what, what is it, sometimes when we talk about being professional, it's about us as being like a blank canvas for other people to project their kind of ideas onto that we don't want to give away sort of too much because we have this notion that it actually will distract from their experience. People are considering you then, who you are, and how are you going to respond to me because of this, rather than um, some of your values or, or whatever, rather than um, what, what, you, what I need you to be. So I can't project this uh, on so well. Um, uh, and I, I mean, I don't think that I kind of, sort of say that sometimes I'm spending, I'm too busy. I am got so many things going on. I don't actually really have that much time to be unprofessional. <laughs> actually, I have, I, there's, there's not that much. But at the same time, I don't share, you know, don't tweet things all the time that are like really. But I will say if I'm out sort of seeing some music and it's very good, I don't mind. I don't worry that that's going to influence people too much about me. I don't think that. My mind has moved on to thinking that that's not people will view me more than important people in a kind of totality rather than these just isolated bits. Uh, and, but maybe I'm over optimistic about that. Thank you. There's a question just here, but as the microphone moves round, can we take one online? It's, it's a fairly yes. general question, Anne Marie. Oh, is it? Um, what are the implications of being a public general practitioner? Oh, this is actually came from that gentleman. Over there. Oh, wow. <laughs> you could have asked the question. <laughs> True, <laughs> my, did. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to it? Wait for yeah. the microphone, yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Anne Marie. Uh, and that was a re refreshing presentation, actually. It, it made us all think, I, I, I believe, uh, about issues of identity and so on. But um, the reason I asked that question is because I know a lot of other practitioners in other fields, like you know, in, in law, for instance, who are doing a very similar thing to this. Firstly, the question is, do you think there's going to be an increase in this kind of public performance of your profession? And secondly, if that's the case, um, what do we do about things like authenticity? You know, uh, who, yeah. who, somebody might masquerade as a doctor or a lawyer and not actually be one, and they might be giving dangerous advice. Yes. Well, I suppose... <laughs> I suppose that I was actually, what I was trying to say is I have not, I am not prepared to move into this space and practice as a professional, as a GP. 
That is not at all my kind of what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that you cannot have an absolute that, you know, anybody comes and asks me anything medical, I will say, sorry, excuse me, I cannot respond to that because that's not, doesn't fit with me also being like an educator and being somebody that wants to share knowledge. But I don't believe that just giving a simple piece of information like that, a very transactional thing, to me, that's not being a doctor. That's not being a GP. Because if I was a GP in that situation, or even if I met you, somebody here, and somebody said this, and I would say, well, gosh, what, you know, that sounds awful. Why, why is that, or what's happening, or whatever? And we would have a very different conversation to me just saying, oh, yes, it means that it's spread through the blood or the lymphatic city channels. And then they said, oh, well, it's about a friend, and they don't know about um, this and whatever. And I, you know, all I was sort of saying about that <coughs> sounds very distressing. But I didn't get into a big dialogue about it. I was not being a doctor in that uh, situation. And I don't think that we should, I don't feel happy or comfortable sort of going on, although uh, in being in that public way, but as I'm saying, we might be challenged about how do we, if other people start coming forward, you know, how much then do we actually be reflexive and respond to what other people decide? How do we assess that actually you understand what you're doing and that uh, you're confidential? How do, how do you understand that? Do I have a greater, that even if you think that you want to, share everything in public. Do I want to be seen as how I practice in public? Do I have rights about this as well? So I, I, I wouldn't advocate it by any sort of thing. And I think I'm, I wanted to, wanted to talk though more about how you actually can, what are the issues of these things come up and you, you, haven't, you haven't set out for them to be there. We had a question over here. Oh. Hello? Yes. Um, one of the conundrums in medical education is that often the context of learning and the um, learning methods uh, move ahead and the um, mirroring assessments that we apply to students don't change. Mm -hmm. um, this will probably apply to medical practitioners in terms of the presence that you, you've been talking about. What guidelines or what processes could be gone through for your college um, law builders in terms of what you might be suitable for or not, or what will be acceptable practice. Um, yeah. How can we fast track that process or update their concepts of what's acceptable and not? Uh, well, I think that this, I mean, I think that this is an important, although I'm sort of talking about getting out there and being reflexive and taking on that, you know, if you're there, you, you will by necessity, on if you can keep conducting yourself just as being, I kind of know what I'm doing. First of all, we don't have the rules, and it's not it's not kind of clear. So you have to, before you even decide to go there, you maybe need to be experienced. You need to, be, you know, uh, because it is not a. I am meeting students there, and I'm supporting them and mentoring them if I come across them. But I am not encouraging my students to go out and start having a public profile. I am not sure that it is a safe place to, you know, to learn to be. But this, it also falls in, like yesterday in the discussion about how students have, or within the VLE and within safe spaces we give, they project maybe like an institutional socialised kind of identity, <coughs> and you come across them in other spaces, uh, and they're, they're in a way different. So there are some people that are out there exploring what does it, what does it feel like to be talking in a public uh, way about this, and, and becoming more confident of their, their identity. And... Um, we give, you know, I'm, I'm talking to some, some, sometimes I take on this mentoring role for people across the UK. A medical student might say, I'm thinking about writing a blog post, somebody from I don't know, Leicester or wherever, I'm thinking about writing a blog post about this. Do you think this is okay? And I say, well, have you thought, would that, would that person be able to recognise who, you, you know, you from that? Maybe you should change this. So in a way, my role as being an ed is no longer just even to people within my own institution. But if I'm there as an educator in that public space, I'm having a a role that's you know m sort of much more far-reaching. I think that we can. Uh, there aren't to me simple sort of rules about this, but and the things that have come out so far tend to be sort of saying you know it is watch out, be careful, um, which I think is right to a certain extent. Uh, and maybe we could give people chances to come in and have these sort of discussions about sort of topics. I'm try to be quite careful about the things that we select for these chat sessions. 
Now we have approached some difficult things, but some people, just, you know, why don't can we talk about um, difficult consult difficult patients? <coughs> and I was like, well, for, I don't really feel that we have difficult patients with difficult consultations. Maybe I'm a difficult doctor some days, rather than. And I think that that would be too too complex a thing to talk about in 140 characters. That would give people a chance to maybe appear unprofessional. This is too 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 complicated for, for a discussion within there. So you have to be careful about the things. So it's much easier to talk about how to use technology in lecture theatre <laughs> than something like that. <laughs> can you wait for mic so we can capture um, So is there actually a, a proper definition for digital professionalism? There's been some really good, interesting work done by Rachel Elloway on this about digital professionalism. And it's Kim, and actually it's very, she's, this was published about a year or so ago in Medical Teacher, and I had actually, Copied, and copied because that's a pay for a journal. I'd taken, <laughs> taken out her sort of simple rules, uh, some of the rules, and put them in a blog post. So if you watch, actually want to see, they're out, they're kind of public there. And I was saying, this is, you know, although you come up with these rules, it's not easy. And I think we're going to try and run a series uh, in our kind of med ed chat sessions with students and people and actually talk about what do these rules actually mean to us? How do we develop? amongst a group of people an idea about, about what, what these sort of ideas are. What does it mean to say you should have a, a professional kind of presence? You know, what, what, what does that mean? So <coughs> we're going to try and hopefully tease that out. So we'd love if people uh, join in, look at my blog, and you'll find more about it, hopefully. Thank you. On that note, Anne-Marie, we're going to have to draw it to a halt. So thank you. Thank you for a great session. <laughs>